big, big deal. Thank you for timing it so that we could talk about it today. 18.7 billion, 179 million square feet, if I've got that right. Tell us about why this deal, why now? So I think this GLP transaction is sort of classic Blackstone, which is invest in scale, because when you do bigger things, there tends to be less competition, and invest in a sector where you have really high conviction. So for us, particularly in real estate, logistics has been our high conviction theme for some time. Why? It's based on the simple premise that goods are increasingly moving from physical retail to online retail. And when that happens, the last stop for your shirt or tie is in a warehouse, not a store. So demand for logistics space goes up. And we have now bought over the last nine years close to a billion square feet. It's hard to imagine. In the US, Canada, Australia, across Asia, Europe, all based on this premise. This particular deal was attractive because GLP owned a bunch of what we call last mile logistics, which are warehouses close to population centers. So if you think about it historically, you could have a warehouse in you know, 100 miles here from New York City, and you'd service the retailer when you needed to and so forth. Now Amazon wants to be at your door an hour Today. or two later. Yeah. And so you want to be close to the GW bridge. So what's happened here is logistics, particularly last mile, has gone up in importance. And so for us, the opportunity to buy a really high quality portfolio in one fell swoop was quite interesting. All right, high conviction, you mentioned that. That's going to be a theme, I think, of our entire conversation. How high is your conviction here? Is there another billion square feet to be, to be bought here? You know, it's hard to say. I, I, I think the fundamentals in the US and around the world remain really solid. So if you look in the US, vacancy is sub 5% in warehouses, the healthiest sector. Rents have been growing close to 7 8% a year. It's possible. I think it's likely that may moderate a bit, and that's what we've assumed. But this movement of goods online continues. 10 years ago, 5% of apparel was sold online. Today, 20% is. And I think that's likely to continue. And so. Yes, I think we'll continue to buy more in the US. I actually think the opportunity in Europe may be more compelling because it's earlier in the cycle, and similarly in some of the markets in Asia. So I think this is a theme that we'll continue to invest behind. Global play, as Global you said. Global play, for sure. And is this a pure real estate play? Help me understand, help us understand sort of how this plays across the entire Blackstone, Blackstone portfolio. Yeah, it's more than that in the sense we bought in Europe a racking system business that builds racking systems in Europe for warehouses. We bought some online payment businesses. You know, we like to find some of these big themes that we can believe in and then express it across the firm. So, you know, do something in real estate, in infrastructure, in private equity, lend to a space that you like. I think this is a big theme that we can deploy capital globally and across sectors. So if I look over the course of your career and Blackstone over the last 15, 20 years, especially in real estate, I see a couple of these high convictions. Single family homes was post-financial crisis. Hotels, you know, Hilton, Motel 6, et cetera. Is this big, bigger than, uh, as big or bigger than those? Well, it's hard to say. The scale of our business is getting larger, right. so the absolute numbers are bigger. This has clearly been the biggest theme for us. And I would just back up to say we do these big themes because in a world where prices are not so cheap, and obviously that's, I'm sure, been a big theme today, the way you generate outsized returns is identify something you see differently than other people, get a management team who can execute against that, and then go all in. And that's been the case for us, let's say, in the warehouse business. You mentioned single family housing mm -hmm. in the US, Spanish housing, Indian office buildings. Find some things you really believe in and try to make a difference. And what I've seen when I look back over time is you tend to spend a lot of time talking about whether I pay 98 or 100 for an asset. But when you look back in the rearview mirror five or seven years later, that's not what really matters. What matters is, was this the right business asset? Was it in the right sector? Did I have the right people running it? And if you get those things right, those small increments don't really matter. And so concentrating on things you really believe in, I think that's quite important if you want to outperform. You mentioned competition at the beginning of your answer. And yet, 
there is a little more competition now. There was competition for this deal, yes. reportedly. Sure. Uh, How's the competitive landscape for you right now? Because, yes, you have distanced yourself from a lot of the traditional players, but Brookfield, to name yeah. one, uh, is there certainly in the real estate uh, yeah. infrastructure business. How competitive is it out there for deals? Well, I would say across Blackstone, in every field, there's competition. There, there are some markets with less competition than others. But I would say, if I think about it, um, in general, we're operating at a scale where the air is a little bit thinner. So in private equity, if we're managing $25 billion funds, there's a handful of people who can write multi-billion dollar checks. Similarly, certainly in real estate, even a smaller number. Um, Infrastructure is another area where there's a small number who can write really big checks. In the credit world, same story. Our hedge fund solutions business, our secondaries business. It's funny, in the public markets, if you want to buy a million dollars of stock and I want to buy 100 million, you've got the competitive advantage. In the private markets, being the, the one person who can provide the solution is a real advantage. So scale is better. Mm -hmm. So we saw that certainly in this case. Uh, we saw it in the case of GE Real Estate. We saw it in the Thomson Reuters deal in our private equity business last year. So we continue to find that scale works for us. Plus, you're able to attract great talent to run these businesses. You're able to be very efficient. And I do think the scale we operate on is one of the reasons why our returns have consistently outperformed almost every metric. And I think that's maybe something people underappreciate. All right, staying on the news just for a, a minute, and then I want to get into a little bit of your investing philosophy. On the news, China trade, Mexico trade, tariffs, Huawei, tech sell-off, you name it. How is that playing through your portfolio? How concerned are you from a macro level and from a micro level yeah. in your portfolio about that? So we don't have a ton of businesses in the global supply chain. We certainly have some, and they are being impacted by this. And I would say, um, so that's an, that's an issue. I think the broader issue is what it means for markets, what it means for confidence, and what it means for economic growth. And obviously, if this persists, um, we're going to see less economic growth. We're going to see more uncertainty. Markets logically have traded off. That makes sense. Um, so I think as investors, you have to be uh, mindful of that. And also, I would say sometimes you don't necessarily think through all the multiple impacts of these things as they play through a lot of industries. So I think it makes you generally a little more cautious. Now, the bond market has moved much more cautious. Right. Um, with a 10-year now two and European yields quite negative. Um, U.S. growth is still okay, although we're waiting to see the impact here. So how I, soon do you think we'll see the impact? Is it the next quarter? Is it this year? I think it's this year. I think you'll see it incrementally. There are definitely companies today who are trying to move their supply chains. That has an impact. And you're making companies, if you think about what drives economic growth, this is one of the challenges about Brexit is, if people have confidence that tomorrow things will be better, then they'll make capital expenditures or hiring decisions based on that confidence. If they feel very uncertain about the future, they tend to pull back. And I do think the tax cut last year was helpful in building confidence. Um, and I think now there's um, more wariness with, in terms of what's going on. And I, I will say this, I, I still think as it relates to US and China on trade, ultimately, I think there should be a resolution because it's in both parties' interest. There's a recognition of a rebalancing that should be taking place. This is really about the pace and extent of that rebalancing. I do think the technology side of this is harder to resolve. Right. And we may end up in sort of a bipolar technology world. Well, and to that exact point, I mean, rebalancing is one thing. It feels like, at least on the tech side, we're looking at decoupling in a lot of ways, these two economies. You work at a place, your boss, Steve Schwartzman, intimately involved in, in China. He's a confidant of the leaders of both uh, countries, US and China. How worried are you about that sort of decoupling? How worried is the firm? Well, as I said, I think the firm, obviously, everyone recognizes in the near t term the parties have moved apart. And, and I think everybody's disappointed that's occurred. But I think there is a sense that, again, it's in the collective yeah. interest of both parties to come back together. That's why I think on, in terms of trade and reciprocal openness of markets, I think progress ultimately will be made. I, I think the technology thing is just tougher. Yeah.
All right, so let's talk about a year or so uh, into this new job. You were running real estate. Now you've got a much broader remit as the president and COO. What do you feel like is the biggest impact so far you've made on the firm from a cultural perspective? You're a guy who grew up at the firm. Uh, take us inside year one. Yeah. Well, I did this office spoof video at the end of the Christmas season last year, and that got a very big hit rate. So that may be my big thing. Um, <laughs> I would say- So holiday card check. Holiday but, yeah. card check. Right. Um, I think you know the biggest impact, I'd say in two areas I've really been focused on it. And I'd start by saying that my predecessor, Tony James, had done an amazing job. So this was not, and, and Steve Schwarzman, there was not a need here to do a lot of course correction. Um, I'd say the two areas I've focused a lot on have been integration, which is we have large businesses in private equity and real estate and credit and hedge funds and secondaries and infrastructure. But at times, we didn't always get the best out of all of them. We collect a lot of data from our companies. We can share a lot of that data, which will make us better investors. If you think about investing as pattern recognition, connecting dots, as maybe the largest owner of assets in the world, there are a lot of dots we can connect. So doing a better job in that area. When we see investment opportunities in one group that doesn't fit its mandate, making sure we share that with another group who may have the right capital. Um, when we go out and see our customers, our clients, making sure we understand we're not just working for one business unit, the whole firm, our support services being the best at everything we do and integrating that. So integration, I would say, is one big theme. And then the second thing is um, maybe a little bit more of a push towards growth. Yeah. And when I talk about growth, I, I do it in the context of what makes asset prices go up. What makes them go up is either multiple expansion or cash flow growth. And multiples, for the most part, are pretty high for most assets. So what you need is growth. How are you going to find that? It makes you want to do more in Asia. We raised a second opportunistic real estate fund, our first Asia private equity fund. It makes you want to look at things like life sciences. We bought this business, Claris, uh, which we now renamed Blackstone Life Sciences, with an intense focus on phase three trials. There's a huge need of capital in that space. Uh, we hired a very senior individual in the growth equity space, again, with the idea of building up in that area. And then across our firm, it could be in credit, private equity, real estate, making sure we're looking at the impact of technology in everything we do. Mm -hmm. Because that's a major risk, but also a major opportunity. So trying to focus a little more on that across the whole firm. You know, I was interested a, a couple weeks ago that you were the commencement speaker at Wharton, your, your alma mater. And I do wonder, as you get into this job, and giving a speech like that is always a time of reflection. Yeah. I got a chance to, to read it and watch it. I mean, what was the animating principle that you sort of looked at from there that you apply today? I think the animating principle was that things don't always go perfectly in any way, shape, or form. Um, that when I think about my own life growing up in suburban Chicago and all the things that sort of went wrong, which is what I talked about in the speech, sitting on the bench on a 1 in 23 basketball team, not necessarily being the best with the ladies, um, <laughs> you know, ha having some failed investments earlier in my career that those things teach you a lot. And, and you can learn from those. I sort of describe them as hidden gifts. And that those hidden gifts, if, if, if you learn them, you can transform them to make yourself a better person, make yourself a better investor. And that has definitely been the case, that seeing the down cycle, seeing the ability to hold on to great assets that ultimately recovered in value, really important. You know, meeting my wife and realizing, hey, I may not get another shot like this, I should hold really tight, <laughs> really important. And so I think for me, that has been formative. And as you know, in the investment business, things often go wrong. And if you don't have an ability to have some resilience, some optimism, I think it's a really tough business. So when you say the word hidden, it's hard to think about private equity being hidden at this point. In a firm like Blackstone, how much do you worry at this point about the geopolitics, the reputational risk, all these different things. It feels like something, having watched you for quite some time in this business, that you very much take to heart. How much do you worry about that right now? The size, the scope of the industry, the size, the scope of Blackstone. Well, I'd say there are a lot of things you worry about. 
and and clearly the geopolitical is creating more of a challenge. You know, historically, um, business and politics intersected, but I'd say more infrequently. And today, um, it could be trade wars, it could be rent control initiatives in our real estate business, it could be um, issues around energy and environmental impact. You, you can't sort of be closed off to that. And we've chosen as a firm to be highly engaged and aware of what's going on because it has a, such a big impact on our investors. I, I would say more broadly, you know, for us, I think the most important thing is we have to constantly remember and focus on delivering great returns for our investors. That's the most important thing. And that's what's allowed the business to grow. That's allowed us the last two years and this year to raise more than $100 billion. Steve Schwarzman had a line at one of our investor days where he said, we're like a restaurant. If we serve good food, our customers will come back. They'll try other items. We can expand. And so for us, first and foremost, delivering great returns is what matters. And getting at that is, is about really, in my mind, two fundamental things. One is having incredibly talented people who are driven, creative, care a lot, good human beings, all of that, and are encouraged to take risks to go out and look at telecom infrastructure in Latin America, get on airplanes, find things. And then overlaying against that a superstructure, an investment process that takes into account political risk, regulatory risk, technological disintermediation, rising interest rates, rising labor costs, and is very centralized in that decision-making process. And when I think about the business, we have to get both of those things right. If you, if you don't allow creative energy, you don't encourage it, you're not going to find interesting things that generate returns. On the other hand, if it's sort of the Wild West, you're not going to have the discipline that knocks out things where you have bad governance or there's too much risk. The, the person on the deal team isn't seeing the big picture. And so I would say sort of overlooking all of that is essential. And when mm -hmm. I think about the role is making sure we've got great talent on the field, encouraged, meritocracy but also making sure we're very protective of our investors' capital. More political risk coming, you think? We got a presidential election you may not be aware of. I, you know, I think, I think this is now the status quo. I think what's underlying a lot of this is technology is transforming um, so many industries, creating so much dislocation. And so it's not just a US phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. So I would anticipate that politics will continue to play a big role. Year two in this job, what's your biggest uh, priority? Um, I'd say two things. One is being very mindful and cautious as we deploy capital. It, it is even More cautious did, this year than you were last year, you think? Um, similarly, but just may, being mindful. We, we're, we're obviously, like everyone's commented, getting deeper into a cycle. But then the second thing is, as we expand, back to my earlier comments, that we're, we're staying true to sort of our values, that our process, if we create a new business in infrastructure, or life sciences growth, that, that it's hooked into Blackstone, mm -hmm. that we don't have any sort of free-floating molecules, um, and so that we manage this growth in the most thoughtful way possible. Because I think there are enormous advantages from the scale we, we've created. On the flip side, if, if we're not mindful, that's how we get in trouble. So, I would say the biggest priority is to make sure we manage this growth in a really thoughtful way and deliver the customers showing up for these new um, products as right. great an experience as what we've done in our historic products. So let's finish up in the last minute that we have where we started high conviction clearly around this deal that you announced yesterday. Where's your next highest conviction as you look across the firm or as you yeah. look across the opportunity set? I'd throw out a couple. Um, you know, even though a lot of things are happening virtually, human beings still exist. And so live entertainment, meetings, conventions, resort hotels, we've made a huge push. Gaming, human beings still want to get together and have fun. So we've done a lot of that in a bunch of different areas. I think the shale revolution is very powerful here in the United States. It's powerful in that maybe it will hold down energy prices. Um, certainly, but it means volumes will be much higher. So owning midstream assets, financing them, owning them in infrastructure, creating them in our energy business, I think that's really powerful. I think geographically, India has a long runway. I think mm -hmm. we're in the early stages. I think the Modi election was very powerful. 
I would say the UK is interesting just because it is so, um, so much negative perception around it. And so I think it offers some interesting opportunities. So it's a big world. There are still plenty of things to do. I know at conferences like this, people can get negative, but you've got to constantly keep looking. Right. Well, on behalf of the human beings here, we really appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Back.